Testament reading today. Uh, it comes from Psalm 67, verses 1 to 7. Um, and if you're using one of the church Bibles, you can find it on page 481. Psalm 67, to the choir master with stringed instruments, a psalm, a song. May God be gracious to us and bless us and make his face to shine upon us, Salah, that your way may be known on earth, your saving power among all nations. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. Let the nations be glad and sing for joy, for you judge the peoples with equity and guide the nations upon earth. Salah. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. The earth has yielded its increase. God, our God, shall bless us. God shall bless us. Let all the ends of the earth fear him. This is the word of the Lord. Hey everyone, my name is Jaden, and I have the pleasure of doing the New Testament reading, which comes from Matthew chapter 28, verse 16 to 20, which can be found on page 835 of the Church Bibles. Matthew chapter 28, verse 16. Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him. But some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. This is the word of the Lord. Well, thank you again for having me here tonight. Um, I'm conscious that it's in church, it's not always easy when a new speaker comes along. Um, take a bit of getting used to. So thank you for your kindness in welcoming me tonight. Uh, I'm going to pray for us to start off and then we'll get into it. Our gracious Father, thank you so much for your word. Thank you that you have not left us alone in this world, uh, but do you speak to, your, to you, you speak to us through it. You reveal yourself to us through it. And above all, we thank you for Jesus. We thank you for these words of his now and we pray that you would write them onto our hearts and we pray this in his great name and for his glory. Amen. Well, yes, keep your Bibles open there, Matthew 28. We're going to be looking at these last five verses of this great gospel together and, uh, and to many of us they're uh, very well-known verses, aren't they, uh, Matthew 28? But my question for you is are they well-heeded? They may be well-known but are they well-heeded? We take them to heart. My prayer for tonight is that they would be, that you and I would hear these words of Jesus and grow in our courage for making him known in all the world. Uh, I am here tonight to talk about mission and to encourage you in your mission partnership. Uh, but I guess the question is, when I refer to mission, what do I mean? Um, I think it's helpful for me to be clear up front that I'm not talking about the task of uh, evangelising Strathfield and, and Enfield. Um, as important and as, as vital as that is, when I'm, when I'm talking about mission, I'm talking about making Jesus known in, in other parts of the world, uh, crossing cultures with the gospel of, of Jesus where there's little to no awareness of who he is or what he's done. That, that's, that's what I'm referring to when I talk about mission. Uh, and, and at its heart, this, this concept of mission, it's about sending. It's about sending. Missionaries are not simply people who go. They are people who are sent. And that distinction, I think, is really important for us to hold on to. Uh, on the one hand, it's really important for our missionaries. Uh, if you are someone who 
leaves Australia, leaves your home to serve in places where you have no friends, no family, no language, uh, you can start to feel pretty lonely, pretty vulnerable, pretty quickly. Uh, and in those early years, the, the testimony of many of our missionaries, the, the question that many of them ask is, what am I doing here? Should I be here? But you see, it's, it's often in these moments where many of our missionaries remember that I didn't go off my own bat. I, I have been sent by a great network of supporters like, like you guys. And so it's, this, this idea of being sent can be a really great encouragement for our missionaries in those sorts of moments. But you see, it's important for another reason too because it highlights the vital role that people like you and me play as senders. And I really want to uh, honour the senders as much as the sendees, if I can put it that way. Without senders, mission could not happen. Without people like, without people like you, without churches like you, mission couldn't happen. And so when I talk about mission, I'm talking about you either being sent or you sending people to other parts of the world to grow Christ's church. That's what we're on about. The question, I guess, though, is why? Why mission? Why mission? One of the privileges of my role at CMS is I get to meet with all the missionaries as they come back for home assignment, and I get to speak with them, hear their stories, and uh, without fail, I am always encouraged by their willingness to serve in hard places, uh, to endure tough things for the sake of making Jesus known. Why do they do it? Why does a talented young woman who has so much opportunity here in Australia, why does she go off to the Middle East for the sake of serving Jesus there? Or why does a, a young family leave the safety and security of life here in Australia to work in a remote Bible college in East Africa or, or among university students in Taiwan? Why would you give your time, your energy, your, your money to support this sort of gospel work? Why mission? Well, I, these verses in Matthew 28, I think, provide us with very compelling reason and very compelling motivation. And to help us see that, I'm going to look at them, these verses under three headings tonight, and they're in your outline, a great conviction, a great commission, and a great companion. Three things that should really motivate us for making Jesus known to the ends of the earth. So first of all, the great conviction. Now, we pick up the story, this is right at the end of Matthew 28, and as we, we pick it up, it's fair to say that Jesus' followers, uh, they were feeling uncertain, uh, very uncertain. Uh, one of their very own had betrayed Jesus, and as a result, they had seen their beloved leader suffer the most torturous, most shameful, most undeserved deaths imaginable. And in the midst of all that, they themselves had run for their lives. They'd abandoned Jesus. They'd deserted him. As the shepherd was struck, the sheep were scattered. And so they were in a state of chaos, really. Un uncertainty was reigning. And certainly this lofty ideal of a world that knows Jesus, it seems at this point to be a lost cause. Can you imagine if someone like me came along at this point and encourage people to give money to, for this Jesus to become known in all the world, it would have been a ridiculous prospect, right? He's, he's been killed. And absolutely, it seems like a lost cause, except for one thing. I'd heard reports that Jesus' tomb was empty and that he'd been raised from the dead, which is an outrageous report. Very far-fetched, it seems. But in verse 16, we see the way that these men respond to this news. And, and even though these men had deserted Jesus, they'd run a mile and they'd been scattered, here we see them coming together again, gathering together again and showing fresh signs of allegiance to Jesus. Take a look at that, verse 16. It says, Then the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. Galilee wasn't just around the corner. It was, it was a long trip. It, it took great commitment to go to Galilee. Now, this wasn't just like walking to the local shops. 
But the thing to notice there at the end, I think, is to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. Christian discipleship is about listening to Jesus and faithfully trusting what he has to tell you and what he has to teach you. And these men, these deserters, are starting to demonstrate discipleship again. Doing what Jesus told them to do, going where Jesus told them to go, to this mountain. And so it's a promising turn at the end of this this gospel. And the thing is, when they get to the mountain, their faithfulness is rewarded, isn't it? The reports they'd heard are powerfully and wonderfully confirmed. Verse 17, they saw him. And when they saw him, they worshipped him. But some doubted. They fell to their knees at what they witnessed. And you can't really blame them, can you? I mean, this man had been dead. They'd seen him hanging on the cross. But now here he is, before their very eyes, alive. And to witness that would make any knee tremble. And any experience with the risen Lord Jesus ought to cause you to worship. It's a very natural response. But that's not to say that this is easy to believe, this account of the the resurrection. And and actually we're told very helpfully, I think, that even some who were there doubted. I I find this quite comforting, actually, that it doesn't mean rank unbelief. It it simply means that some were hesitant, they were cautious. They, They found it difficult to explain what was going on. And I've got to tell you that I would have been one of the ones in that group. But doubt does not disprove reality. And I actually think this little detail adds so much authenticity and so much credibility to this story. Even to those who were there, this was extraordinary. Their doubt highlights that this was in no way a normal thing. It's it's absolutely unique. But you see, it's a unique thing that points to a unique truth. And that is that this Jesus is the one and only Son of God. That's what's going on here. And that's why Jesus' words in verse 18, we need to listen to very carefully. They're so vital. Jesus came to them and said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. All authority. Not partial authority. Not authority just over this particular patch (laughs) or over this particular group of people or even just this particular point in time. It's all authority. It's comprehensive. And friends, this is the life-giving conviction that you and I hold as Christians. The resurrection of Jesus demonstrates that he alone has the right to rule all things and all people in all places through all time and beyond. This is the scope of his authority. All authority has been given to him in heaven and on earth. There is not an atom in the universe, not an angel in the sky, not, a, not an angel in heaven, not a star in the sky, not a, not a person on this planet that falls outside the scope of Jesus' authority. That's how complete it is. Now, of course, I think it is right to just be a little bit cautious at this point, isn't it? I mean, it's a bit, it, it, this sort of prospect, it's, it's right to be a bit nervous about it because in our world, this sort of comprehensive power rarely equates to good things, does it? In our world, we, we, we see it give rise to all sorts of atrocities, people who coerce and control through force and fear just to achieve their own agenda and to serve their own selfish purposes. It, there are too many stories of that in our world, and they're appalling stories. And so I understand if we get a bit nervous about that, but we've got to recognise that Jesus is in no way like that. This is his authority is not exercised like that. Jesus is fundamentally governed by love 
and mercy and compassion and kindness and generosity and self-sacrifice. The power Jesus wields, the authority he has, it is not oppressive or tyrannical. It's liberating. He sets people free. It's empowering. He gives them life. You might remember earlier on in Matthew's Gospel, that beautiful verse, Matthew 11, verse 28, where Jesus famously says, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. That's what Jesus does with his power. He is so strong, he is so powerful that he offers to carry our load for us and he takes the weight of our burden from us and he puts it onto himself. He does all the heavy lifting and he does that so beautifully and powerfully on the cross, doesn't he? Where he bears our sin and shame. He came not to be served but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. And that's the authority that he has, the life-giving authority. And friends, it is that conviction. It is that conviction that ought to motivate us in making Jesus known across the whole world. And that's why Jesus says what he says next. And uh, it's our second point tonight, uh, this great commission. The Great Commission, because all authority has been given to Jesus, it is relevant and it is applicable for the entire world. Uh, it can't be anything less, actually. <laughs> and so in verse 19, Jesus spells out the only logical conclusion that flows from his resurrection from the dead. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. The command here is to make disciples. Make disciples, make followers of Jesus. Bring people under this authority. Jesus' life-giving authority yearns for people to come under that authority. But you see, it's not an authority that is limited just to one group of people. It, it's the whole world. The whole world is on scope here. All nations. Uh, one of the great things about Matthew's gospel, from beginning to end, it's actually all about discipleship. The, the, the name Matthew itself means disciple. Uh, and this whole gospel has been about uh, demonstrating Jesus' authority and encouraging people to come under that authority. Uh, and, and what we find here right at the very end of this gospel is that the agenda of this gospel actually becomes the agenda of anyone who follows Jesus. It, it, if you are a disciple of Jesus, then you long for other people to become disciples of Jesus. Because a disciple of Jesus is someone who has tasted and seen that the Lord is good. And we want others to taste that as well. And this is really what a true understanding of Jesus' authority should, should do for us. It, it, sh it shouldn't keep us still or inert or static. It should get us going and, and getting us looking out uh, with the, an ends of the earth perspective. And I certainly think Matthew 28 encourages an extra special longing for people from all cultures to come under the authority of Jesus. Because that's who he is. It reflects the eternal lordship of our, of our saviour. Now, of course, th th this is a command too, but it's not a command that we uh, adhere to with this sort of spirit of compliance. Oh, okay, I'll do that. It's sort of, that's the response I often get from my kids. Uh, but th this is, th we don't comply to this command like that. We, it, this is a command that, that we adhere to out of a sense of joy and gladness. And it, it's such a privilege to be able to share the goodness of our Saviour with other people, isn't it? They may not like it, but it's our delight. Because we love him. Because he loves us. And so we go out with a sense of joy and gladness and, and, and eagerness. And, and we do that because the life he offers is second to none. It's, it's second to none. Because it's a life that reconnects us with the God 
who created us. So that making disciples, baptising them into the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. This is what it means to become a disciple of, of Jesus. When we follow him, we become immersed in a relationship with the God of the universe. And what Jesus offers people like you and me across the whole world is an inseparable and perfect bond of unity with our creator. And there's nothing better than that. Nothing more valuable, nothing more important for a person's soul than to be reconnected with their creator. It's a precious life. And it has a precious lifestyle associated with it. Encouraging people to be obedient to, to Jesus, to, to obey everything that he has commanded you. And, of course, the, the essence of Jesus' teaching is, is what? Is love. Caring for each other, giving yourself up for others. Can you imagine what a world would look like if, if, if that was the, the law, if that was what people did, if, if that's what people were obedient to? It would be a very, very beautiful world and a very, very beautiful life. The, the, the lordship of Jesus, what we invite people uh, to come underneath the authority of, is, is an excellent life. It is very, very good. And this is what Jesus urges us to do. So we have this great conviction. We have this great commission. But all of that leads to the third and final point, and that is this great companion. We ought to be motivated by mission because we have a very, very great companion. There is these five verses. There's so much to appreciate in these five verses. I love them. I do get a bit carried away with them. Uh, but the thing is, as I've prepared this talk, as I keep coming to this, there's, there's, just, there's always one word that just grabs my attention, and it's simply the word with. With. Uh, it may seem, you may think I'm a bit strange uh, having a love affair with this word, but it is a great word, isn't it? Uh, this word with, it, it, it conveys connection and closeness, it communicates togetherness and intimacy, it's a word of partnership and union. And really, it embodies so much of what we long for, what we yearn for as human beings. And here, right at the end of this gospel, it's a word which Jesus himself applies to our relationship with him, here and now, if we are his disciples. Have a look at that, right at the end of verse 20. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. I hope you can see how precious this promise is. This promise of companionship from the Lord of the universe to the very end of the age. If you're a follower of Jesus, he promises not to leave you on your own, to figure out your own way. He promises to be with you, always to the very end. And it's a precious thing, isn't it, to have someone who loves you be with you. To have someone who is on your side be by your side. To support you, to guide you, to encourage you, to give you just what you need when you need it. The sad thing is that there are a lot of people who only know the power of with when they are without. Without a job, without a friend, without a spouse. But friends, the reality is there are a lot of people in this world who are without a saviour and who are without hope. And uh, if our news is anything to judge by, I would suggest that our world is in a hopelessness epidemic at the moment. 
And we have a message of hope for them. And when it comes to this business of cross-cultural gospel mission, this promise is just so precious. And, and many of our missionaries, their testimony is that they'll, they'll talk about the times of loneliness when they're on location, away from friends, family, and hostile climates and contexts. They'll talk about this, but very often it is this truth that helps them to get through that day, knowing that Jesus is with them by his spirit, through his word. Jesus is with them. And friends, I want to encourage you in your partnership to remember that Jesus is with you as well. As you pray, as you give, as you express your partnership in mission, Jesus is with you just as he is with our missionaries. And so your, your partnership is actually genuine participation in mission. Now, this is a really key thing that, that, that I, I encourage people with, that your partnership in the gospel is genuine participation in the gospel because of Christ's presence. He's with you. He's with them at the same time. And so I want to in, encourage you with, with that. So we have three things, a great conviction, a great commission, and a very great companion uh, and really, I, I guess I asked the question at the beginning of this talk, you know, are these verses well heeded? You, you've probably heard these verses a lot of times before, but have we taken them to heart? I'm sure you have, but I'm sure that they could sink deeper. And I just want to, I guess I just want to close with a few encouragements. I, I think, when I think about this prospect of a world that knows Jesus, I've got to say that sometimes I feel like it just feels impossible. Uh, and I sometimes feel like those disciples, as they would have been heading to Galilee, as though this whole business is a lost cause. And I think sometimes I'm tempted to just bunker down and just, all right, I'll just live out my own faith and, and not worry too much. But the reality of Jesus' authority, all authority in heaven on earth has been given to him it's, it's, it's got to lift our eyes out from that hopelessness, doesn't it? Gospel mission is never a waste of time or energy. God can do immeasurably more than we can imagine. And so that's the first thing. Gospel mission, never a waste of time, never a waste of energy. The, the second thing I want to say is that I think Jesus' commission, it, it really does urge us to have a very outward-looking perspective in our faith, always looking out, always seeking opportunities to share the gospel across cultures. And I think a, a, a question that I have challenged myself with and a question I want to challenge you with is this, how much do I have an ends-of-the-earth perspective to my faith? How much do you have an ends of the earth perspective to your faith? I know it's very easy for me to have an end of my nose perspective <laughs> to, to my faith. I, I often don't look much beyond my own needs. We're all very capable of that, aren't we? But how much do we have this ends of the earth perspective to, to, to who we are as, as Christians? I want to encourage you to, tr to try to grow that more and more. Um, not, only, not only in terms of geography, and thinking about all different locations to the ends of the earth, but also in time. Think a lot about when Jesus returns and have that ends of the earth in your mind and let that shape uh, your walk with Jesus. And then, of course, the third and final thing I just want to encourage you, take, take courage from Jesus' presence. It is a very precious thing. The one who commands the heavens and the earth he is on your side and he is by your side. Through his word, by his spirit, he is here. He is with you. And the task of gospel mission, it may seem impossible, but with him, you have a very great companion. And so I really want to encourage you, if you are someone who is thinking about being sent, or if you're thinking about being, sent, being a sender, Take courage from this wonderful saviour. I'm going to pray for us.
Our gracious Father, thank you so much for the Lord Jesus. Thank you that all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to him. And Father, we just pray that out of the fullness of that authority, you would help us to understand the importance of taking this message of the gospel to all nations so that all people might obey all that he has taught. And Father, we thank you for the very precious promise that he is always with us to the very ends of the age. I pray, Lord, that you would give us courage in this work of the gospel. Help us to be good partners. And Father, for those of us who are thinking about being sent, I pray that this authority of Christ might really spur us on to take courage for those next steps. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.